Hey everyone, this is Keish Leiker from Gaming Trend and Tabletop Throwdown, and I'm here with Rob Davio, and he is now a part of Restoration Games, and they had a big Kickstarter with Stop Thief. And Rob, uh, tell us first of all why you uh, were a part of the founding of Restoration Games. Yeah, sure. Um, well, I left Hasbro about five years ago to do new game designs, mm -hmm. um, which I still wanted to keep going, but with and I'm, I'm continuing to do but then Justin Jacobson the founder and president of restoration asked how would I feel being the chief restoration officer of a company that takes old games that are out of print and restores them and put them back in and it just felt like the other piece of the puzzle right because it's it's not <laughs> it's putting the old with the new and so I'm doing both and at my time 14 years with Hasbro uh, I spent a lot of time dealing with classic games whether it was Clue or Risk or Monopoly or Life and sort of looking at them trying to figure out what makes them tick and then how to make them better. So I was doing restoration games in a way at Hasbro for much of my career, so it kind of primed me to, to be ready to do this. What are some of your like early influences as far as like early board games goes? When I was a kid? Yeah. Um, I, you know, you can name all the classics, mm -hmm. and I all the ones that Hasbro mostly owns, and I hit them. Um, but I really became a gamer because of Dungeons & Dragons when I oh, was okay. 11. Um, and that led me to more complicated games, you know, like a Blood Bowl type thing or mm -hmm. little chit counters out of Dragon Magazine or a game called Dragon Master, which came out in 1981, which was my first trick-taking game. Mm -hmm. And uh, I still have a copy of it and it was kind of these beautiful oversized cards with this, this art and it sort of made me a, a deeper gamer. And then 17 years later, I was interviewing to be a game designer at Hasbro and I mentioned Dragon Master. And the guy I was interviewing with had been the in-house developer for it. Oh, and we just wow. hit it off and it had a big part of getting me my job. So Indulgence is a remake of Dragon Master. What I said when we were planning our first line is it would be bad mojo not to have this game in the line because it made me a gamer and then it made me a professional gamer. So this is our good luck totem <laughs> for the line. It's, uh, it's, you know, it's a trick-taking game. Um, so my influences were largely comic books and Dungeons and & Dragons and Star Wars and a lot of storytelling mm -hmm. stuff. I'm, I am uh, at heart a storyteller and a role player, uh, though I still do things that are right. more like traditional like racing games mm -hmm. and deduction games. So you've shown us a little bit about Indulgence and then you have Stop Thief and uh, Downforce. Yeah. Downforce, yeah. So Stop Thief, we did have the successful Kickstarter for that. Yes, thank you everyone. <laughs> And it looks like it'll be bigger and better than what it was before. I remember not having a copy, but having that little mechanical device. That yeah, kind our of mechanical device things. will be better, but not bigger than that one. <laughs> I mean, that, you could kill someone with that. That was like, yeah, it was. It was the first game, or one of the first games, that had a invisible person on the board mm -hmm. with hidden movement because in 1979 they could actually do enough electronics to play sounds and have an AI that kept track of an algorithm of where the thief was on the board so you could enter it in. So um, it was kind of a no-brainer to redo this one. Mm -hmm. uh, it has a lot of fondness. Now, part of makes restoration games restoration and not just like reprint games is we take every game and we figure out if this landed on our desk as a designer submission right now, you know, like the original mm -hmm. game, what would we do to put it up? How would we develop right. it? So we, you know, what Justin and I did is we looked at it and we said, okay, it's got roll and move. You roll two dice and you move, not as popular now as it was mm -hmm. in 79. And it had cards that were like, lose a turn and go back to start. <laughs> and all these things that were just almost like obligated by law to put in games at that time period. So we changed those around. And then it had like a grid that was hard to read and it had like all these like little loose ends. Um, so we sort of just cleaned up the engine. If you played the original, you played this one, and you haven't played them recently, mm -hmm. you might not even notice. You'd be like, oh, I don't remember how it plays. Yeah, that makes sense. And if you have played them, people have said, oh, this is better, right? It's a little bit less random. And then the nice thing is, I got my phone right here, is instead of having uh, a giant unit, you can play the game on your phone. I had it open, so I'll do it right here. I can just load Stop Thief, and because it's a phone, not an app. We can do different difficulty settings. We can put new modes. Every couple months, you will just get a chance to you know, turn on and be like, oh, there's a one Slide versus many thing. now. There's a co-op <laughs> version now. There's a kid's version now. So we can keep creating a new story mm -hmm. just based on this this one game. Cool. What's the story behind, behind Downforce? I actually don't remember this one at all. Okay. Well, Downforce is our, our new name. This has had many names um, in many different versions, starting mostly in the 90s into the early 2000s. Uh, Wolfgang Kramer, 
probably Wolfgang Kramer, <laughs> um, had a series of games that were known by Top Race, as it's well known, it was also Daytona 500 and Detroit Cleveland Grand Prix, and it's essentially a racing game on a board. And I played it when I first started at Hasbro, because Milton Bradley just put it out as Daytona 500, and I really liked it. And then my kids, who are much older now, mm -hmm. um, right. but when they were, they were kids, we would play it uh, like as a family and we would just mm -hmm. turn the cards over and just sort of watch like a horse race like a car race and try to <laughs> well, I think it's gonna be green and just root for them and so I liked it both as a fun quick game and I liked it also emotionally because I played it with my kids so two of these games are definitely Rob decided to have an emotional connection to <laughs> so we went to I met with Wolfgang at Essen last year and we just the rights were available and we just got the rights to it um, but we didn't have the right to the name, so we renamed it Downforce. Cool. Well, let's uh, go and open up the boxes and take a look at some of them. So first up, we have Stop Beep, as we mentioned before, which was successfully funded on Kickstarter, which is impressive because I think it was also during the time Rising Sun was on Kickstarter as well. Yeah, we taught them a lesson. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a hidden movement game. Let's talk about like what the difference is between the... Uh, current version and the or the original version are sure. I mean the, the big difference is going to be the app Going to be the app, right? You're gonna have an app instead of like a crime scanner in many ways the game is the same Although the board looks different the underlying math and the spaces are, are still the same instead of having grids You now have footprints that lead from place to place so the thief is, who's represented by these cards which are new um, Before it was always just a thief, but they didn't have any special powers to them a thief will randomly be chosen by the app to be on one of these red spaces, which is a crime space, in one of these four locations. So you have a bank, you have an electronic store, you have a department store, and you have a museum. You will be told by the app there's a crime that's been committed, let's say, in the bank. So you know that the thief is somewhere on one of these five places, but you don't know which one. You are a detective. We have our detectives right here and we have their corresponding meeples that go with them, which we particularly enjoy to have sort of the silhouettes. Mm -hmm. And I think the favorite one is this guy right here. What's his name? Drake Benedict? Drake Benedict, because now we have our first meeple with chest hair. <laughs> so you, you have your figure, and on your turn, what you do is you play a card from your hand and move that many spaces. Actually, the first thing you do is you get a, a new clue from the app about where the thief moved. And it won't tell you, obviously, that the thief moved from 445 to 446. The thief always moves from number to number. But it might tell you that the thief has gone to a door. So knowing what you know, the thief might have been here and gone to these two doors, or they might have been here and gone to this door or this door. And so from here, they could be at this door, or this one, or this door. But you know it's not either of these, because that's two away from the thief, and they couldn't get there in one turn. So now you know they're on a door space. Next thing you do is you play a card from your hand. The cards are valued for the most part like one to 12, it replaces two dice. So you tend to have two cards that are low down, two that are close to seven, and then two that are higher. And I happen to pick the guy who is fleet of foot. So he moves a little bit faster than average, but doesn't do anything in particular. Where a person who is a different character, in this case, this is Vivian O, as a more normal distribution of cards. Here's your last card. From two to 12, but she's an ex-acrobat, so she can move through windows to get in and around the buildings where the other investigators can. So this is different in this game because in the original game, you just rolled two dice. And since the whole point of the game is to be on the same space or next to where the thief is, you could be playing perfectly well and never catch up to them. Where in this game, you decide whether you're gonna play your high cards or save them or your low cards. And you have to play, it's only when you play your, your lowest card do you get to pick up all your other cards. So you have to sort of catch your breath. And everyone has a different power on their card. In the original game, there was a deck of like power cards that I was mentioning before, like lose a turn or take money. We moved those and kind of worked them into the powers of the characters. So we took the dice in the event deck and we combined them into a movement deck with powers. Very cool. Um, that's kind of almost the entire game. You mm -hmm. get a clue, you move, and then if you want, you can try to arrest the thief. And you would enter the three-digit number mm -hmm. of where you think they are. If you're correct, you would collect the money as shown on the card. Like this is $9,000 to collect her, $10,000 to collect him. Sometimes there's an extra ability you get 
for collecting, you get an extra reward, or you can pick up your cards. And if you've reached a certain money threshold, you win. Um, you need more money with fewer players, right? If it's two player right. game, you need more than a four player game. But assuming you didn't win, you just put out another card, there'll be another crime. Maybe now it's over at Swinnerton's and you have to run over and get there. Um, cool. Now there's different uh, levels of play that we're gonna have right out of the right out of the gate, beginner or standard, intermediate and advanced. And the thief gets cleverer in the advanced <laughs> ones. They'll double back oh, and they'll wow. take the subway and they'll do things and make it harder for you to keep track. You also have the ability to gain a tip um, on your turn. You're like, I don't know where they are, I'm lost. Everyone yeah. has their second to lowest card is gain a tip. And when you gain a tip at the standard level, it literally tells you they're on 463. <laughs> and when you get an intermediate level, it says, well, it's either 427 or 463. And when you do it on advanced level, it says they're somewhere either in this building or this building. <laughs> so it helps, but... So you get you get less help and the thief gets, mm -hmm. gets trickier as you go. Um, and that's about it. Probably takes half hour, 40 minutes to play the game. Cool. How many players is it going to support? It supports uh, two to four. Two to four, okay. And we will have a solo play that we're okay. working on that won't come out at launch, but we're mm -hmm. going to roll it out through the fall, which is you will just play by yourself and you'll have a certain amount of time to catch a certain number of thieves, um, but they may escape. Like if they right. get to the subway, they escape. So you have to like collect, capture a certain amount before a certain amount escape. We're still working on it. Cool, and do you know how much it's going to retail for? This is going to retail for 30 That's a great value for Thank you. all the gameplay that you can get with this. You know, very simple mechanics, but implemented very well within it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, we're just taking games. I mean, that's the nice part about Restoration. We can take a game that largely, that worked very well. It mm -hmm. still largely works quite well, and mm -hmm. we just have to punch it up. And we've got thousands of games to choose from. So yes. hopefully we pick ones that work well. Okay, and the next game that we are taking a look at is Indulgence, which forgot Dragon... Dragon Master. Dragon Master. It's a re-implementation of sort of three games. Dragon Master was a 1981 Milton Bradley game, the one that I sort of kind of fell in love with. And that was a remake of a 1960s Parker Brother game called uh, Coup d'etat, which had a Napoleonic theme, mm -hmm. and which was based on a public domain 1920s trick-taking game called Barcou, which was like a French game, <laughs> which I think also had a Napoleonic theme. And it was French, but neither of them were heavily themed. Mm -hmm. um, so I grew up with Dragon Master, and so it is a is a trick taking game. Um, so you're going to have a hand of cards, and the object is to win or lose certain tricks depending on what we're calling edicts. What we've done is we've moved away from the fantasy realm, and we've moved in sort of the intrigue of uh, Renaissance Italy. So the four decks are the Sforzas, the Medicis, the Borgias, and the Orsinis. And you're using these various people to achieve your ends, which is to accumulate the most uh, money and influence in Italy. Um, the theme is, is very light. You know, it's a, it's a numbered cards with suits and, and money. Um, but it, it ties it together a little bit. Um, the object of the game is to have the most money, these are fives and these are ones, uh, at the end of the game, and the end of the game is after everyone has been the dealer three times. So you're going to play three rounds. It can end earlier if someone runs out of money, it ends, and whoever has the most money then wins. But it's a type of game where um, if you play trick taking games, like in hearts, it's don't take any hearts and don't take the queen of spades. If, and you know, in bridge, you have to make your bid. Like, but it's sort of the same every hand. And what is intriguing about Dragon Master is there is these different edicts, and the dealer decides which edict they're going to pick for that turn. So they might look at their hand and they might pick, okay, this turn we're not gonna, we're not gonna take any Borgias. So this whole suit right here of the green suit, for every person who takes a green card, and there are nine of them, is gonna owe me, the dealer, one coin at the end of the, at the end of the hand. So I might look at my hand and decide this is the best thing, or don't take any sixes. Let's say I all have all below six in my hand. I'm like, nope. Whoever takes sixes is gonna owe me, that tells you right here, you pay two for each six taken. Or don't be the first one to take three tricks. Like I think I can duck and just hide. I might take some at the end, but I have enough cards that I don't have to take it right now. So then there's there's two interesting twists that come from that. First of all, there's a whole stack of edicts. So as you play, you'll play one and a new one will come out. And there's two things, there's kind of a shoot the moon element, which is if I said don't take any Borgias, and you look at your hand and you're sitting on like eight Borgias, you can choose to sin. You take this ring and you claim it. You can put it on if you want. It's always a fancy way of doing it. And you say, I am going to sin against you and I am going to take all of the Borgias. You tell me to take none of them, I will take all of them. And now you are basically saying to the dealer, I'm in charge now. 
right? <laughs> I'm the captain. And um, so then we play sort of an, a reverse hand, where if you take all the Borgias, we're all going to pay you for usurping power, but if you fail, you will owe me quite a bit of money for basically daring to mm -hmm. challenge my rule. Um, and then this comes in handy because it acts like as a wild, like you can use this sort of ring to, to help you achieve your goal. Um, so you have to be careful when you're the dealer of picking something, like if I have a hand where I'm like, I don't have any Borges, I'm going to pick it. You have to be careful that someone else may have all of them and they'll attempt to sin. That's kind of the basic game and then there are certain edicts in here that we recommend playing with the basic game because they're easier. The advanced game is where it really shines. You have all of them in here and then everyone gets a papal bull. Once of the three times when you're a dealer, you don't have to use it, but most people will. Out of the three times, you can choose to do all three edicts on the track. You say, okay, Papal Bull, don't be the first, take three tricks, don't take any Borgias, don't take any sixes, and you are going to pay me for every one of those that you violate. So it's sort of like a mega super hand. Um, just like the regular hand, though, you, someone can turn it over and say, I am going to take the first three tricks, be the first straight three ticks, take all the Borgias and take all the sixes. And it's kind of like this shoot the moon mega sort of thing. If they do it, they win instantly regardless of money. So you could be down to your last coin, get the hand of your life, basically decide you're all in and you're going to try to do it because the hand's over one way or another at the end of that turn. And I've seen people do it. I've seen people flip them over <laughs> down to their last penny and just have the right cards in play to come back. So that's... That's basically, it's about a 45 minute trick taking card game, right. plays three or four players. We got this, the original game, Dragon Master, had this very like out there trippy 70s art. Um, and we couldn't get that art. First of all, it's like we didn't have the rights and physically it was pieces of art that have been lost. Oh, okay. It wasn't digital. Um, so we sort of went with the same theme and recreated the feel of that, like with the tarot size cards. The Milton Bradley game had these like crystals from a different game that snapped together. <laughs> like to, but we went with actual gems. Uh, they didn't have this, they had a card called the Dragon Card and we made it into a ring. And then even though this is cardboard, it's super shiny cardboard, which looks like coins. And you keep them in your little, uh, I don't think they're called a treasure chest, I think, but basically this is your, your holdings in your little, uh, what they okay. call it? So, yeah, but that's where you keep. That's your where you score. keep. That's where you keep your score. Like all the money is basically in play from the game. We gave you a few extra in case you lose it, right. but the money just goes around to different hands cool. as you play. Um, so if you like trick taking games, like every hand's a little bit of do I push it, do I not push it, do I lay low as the dealer, which one of these do I pick, do I use my paper bowl to kind of like have that super big hand where I just get a ton of money. But if I have a really bad hand, does someone have a really great hand and they'll win the game right away? Um, so it's it's a nice, it's not as complicated as the bidding and bridge, but it's got more going on than hearts. Right. So if you like trick taking games, this is a good one that gives you a lot of difference in each game because there's close to 20, I have to look at the exact number, different edicts. Um, so you'll see them in a different order. Some games you won't see all of them. It is possible to see all of them. Okay. In a four player game, if everyone mm -hmm. uses their paper right. bowl, you'll okay. see them all exactly once. But even still, they'll be in different combinations mm -hmm. when people do the oh, big yeah. hand. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of variety in deciding when to do a specific edict yeah. is going to be very important. So when is this looking to be released? All of three of the games we're talking about today will be out at Gen Con and it will be for sale at Gen Con and then rolling into distribution okay. in available at stores either at Gen Con or, or within weeks. After. How much will this retail? This is $20. Okay. Wow, that's a lot for $20. Yeah. Great. Looking forward to, to seeing this one out in the stores, too. So. And finally, we have Downforce, which is a racing game, as is pretty evident by the art and the actual board itself. So what makes this different from, like, Formula Day? Um, it's more of a betting game and a card management game than a racing game. Oh, okay. Now, I was talking yesterday to someone, they said it's not really a racing game, it's a hand management and betting game, because the object of the game is to have the most money. And you're going to spend money one way, and you're going to gain money uh, up to four different ways in the game. So at the start of the start of the game, you'll get a hand of cards. All of the cards will be dealt out, occasionally in like a couple player counts, there'll be a few out of play. Um, but basically all the cards will be in play, and the cards will have either all of those six different colors of the cards on them in a descending order, or they'll just have like one card or some combination in between. And the highest it'll be for the most part is six, and it'll go down to one, and then these are, and they'll be wilds, like either on the card or entire wild cards. 
judging your hand, you will own one or more cards that you will bid on that if that card wins, you will get a payoff at the end of the game. So if you have the black car and the black car wins, you'll get 12 million. And if you get the, if you have the blue car and it comes in fourth, you'll get four million. And then there'll be a very quick auction based on you like bid with your car. If I want the blue car, I might put this card down, flip it over, I bid six for blue because I played the six blue. If it was the highest card played, I put this back in my hand, I don't lose it, and I write down that I paid for six for blue. Once the cards are all bought, the gameplay is very simple. I would play a card, I'm just gonna, let's say I'm gonna play this one, which is six black. You always have to move forward. You can slip between diagonals. So I would go one, two, three, four, five, six. I have to do the top one. And then orange goes five. One, two, three, four, five. Yellow goes four. One, two, three, four. Blue goes three. One, two, three. Red goes two and green goes one. So there's your first card. But let's say everyone was just one step further and then someone was gonna play another card. And let's say I played, uh, I wanna play a good one here, this one. You have to play in order. So let's say I'm not the blue car. I still have this in my hand and at some point I have to play it and move blue six, which I don't want to. I would use to play it at this time because I would go, okay, blue six, one, two, oh, you're blocked. Your other four is just lost. <laughs> then orange goes one, two, three, four. Then green goes, one, two, and then red goes one. So by playing this card at that time, I've kept blue from doing its full movement. So part of the game becomes when you get in these little narrow twists and turns, especially here where it goes down to one lane and here where it goes down to one lane, like getting your car in front or playing cards that effectively burn the other player's turn becomes a big part of the strategy. Now three times in the game, once here, once here, and once here, as soon as the first card crosses over, you then, basically bet who you think is going to win. It doesn't cost you anything, but you just put a little box like, you know, well, orange is way in front, I think orange is gonna win. I don't control them, but I'm gonna put a little side bet on them. And you get to do that three times, and depending on if they win, place, or show, you get bonus money at the end. So at the end, if my car came in second, I get nine. If I correctly picked your car was gonna come in first, I get nine, but let's say I, you know, one came in third and I messed up the last one, I would get nine, 18, I would get 20 million, if I bid five for my car, I netted 15 million in profit, I get 15 points. Um, that's pretty much all the rules. The only thing is you also get powers for your car. Oh, nice. So, um, so if I play a car, card with my car at the top of it, I move that card at one extra space. So if I control blue, that's actually a seven oh, for okay. me. So if, I'm, if I have a, um, a lot of cards where I'm at the top, uh, sorry, it doesn't count with only cards of one color on it. But if I had these three and I got black, I would know I'd get those extra spaces, which doesn't sound like much, but this game really is won by a couple spaces here and there. Um, so what I can, normally when you play a wild, the wild can be anything but a color that's already on there, so this can't be black, green, or red. But if I play unpredictable, I could move black six if I'm black then green four, and then I could move black again too. I could double up on the wilds. So by having these different powers, by having these cards, by betting well, you can win. This is about a 20 minute game oh, wow. to play. And I'm not gonna do anything, but there's a whole board on the other side with the different, like different pinch <laughs> points. This is our country board, and then there's a, like a city board on the other side, which has a different track. So it has like different strategies of how to play it. Cool. Yeah, this, I, I mean, I like the betting aspect. I like the fact that you have some strategy in which cards you're going to play and when, and, and 20 bucks? No, this, or, or 40, no, 20 this is 40. minutes. Yeah, 20 minutes, 20 $40. Minutes, 20 minutes is not long, though. That's, right. You know, that's yeah, and there's, yeah, there's rules that you can, you can play the first game mm -hmm. and then flip it over and play the second game and, and average your scores. Oh, that's... Right, because it is, you do get a hand of cards, mm -hmm. so someone could have a better hand right. than other, but over exactly. two, two hands, you're probably going to balance out. Yeah, and 40 bucks is still a phenomenal value for yeah. this. So we have a $20, a $30, and a $40. Great. Because this thing is big. Right. Well, thank you very much for your time and for showing me all these yeah, games. Thank you.